welcome to something completely different then. So I'm uh, the one talking about plants here. Um, so when I started preparing this talk, I realized I had got myself into a bit of trouble because I really wanted to give a talk here. So I slightly overpromised when I uh, submitted the abstract in January. And then I was like, I'm going to figure it out. I got four months till it was suddenly just like two days left. And I realized I had promised direct RNA-seq and ultra-long sequencing. So follow along to see how that went. Um, but first, so um, Redmond is actually a rather simple uh, genome at first glance. It's not that big like um, the weed or even cattle or humans. It's relatively small. It's deployed. It's uh, about half a gigabase in size. It's got 19 chromosomes, so nothing too hard. The one special thing about the genome characteristics that is, uh, if you know the look at the KMAR plot, it's like very, very heterozygous. That is because we don't normally cross grapevine and reproduce it sexually, but we um, propagate it via cuttings. So the two haplotypes can mutate and mutate further apart over hundreds or even thousands of years. Um, so why is that? It's because, um, yeah, we're not really breeding them because it's not a viable solution. Um, because especially German customers, but not just, I also talk to colleagues from New Zealand who are like, our target audience are the supermarket shelves in the Great Britain, and they only buy it if it's called Sauvignon Blanc. And you can only make a Sauvignon Blanc from a cutting of a Sauvignon Blanc. So crossing something new is not interesting to them. And the same goes for Germans with their Riesling or Italians with their Pinot or French with their Chardonnay. They want what's there, so we need to look into the, the intravarietal uh, diversity there. Um, and this is actually three different pictures, all from Riesling grapes. Yes, there is red Riesling. I also didn't know that when I started working with grapevine. Um, we are mostly interested in what you see in the middle there, because that's a loose uh, cluster architecture. I'm going to get into that later. But because this is a hundreds of years old cultivar, there's a large amount of intravarietal variation. And we're trying to use that. And that works pretty well, actually. So we start like at the um, initial population, which has quite a lot of diversity in it. And we select some interesting clones with interesting phenotypes, like later bud burst or later ripening, for example, or cluster architecture differences. We select then, uh, we propagate then them for a few years, see how stable that phenotype is go into the bee clones where we make more of them, and then we start making wine of them and realize it doesn't taste well, so we discard half that. Some of them work, and then we uh, finally make that into sea clones where we can more wine of them, plant them in different fields and different regions and see if they work there. And then initially, we, and then eventually we got a new grapevine clone that works. As, if you look at the years, that can easily take like 20 to 30 years, and the outcome is like very unclear. So we are now trying to identify markers in the genome that could help us to skip some of those steps that we like figure out there's an interesting mutation or the mutation is not there. So we can discard that from the get-go and shave some years off of that process. Um, so for that, we, are, we decided to make like deployed Riesling references to properly align our reads against that and see if there's some deletions and version that we wouldn't see with short read sequencing alone. So I set off to do that. And the problem is that, like in most other vegetables or fruits, we have bred out the really annoying stuff like polyphenols, especially tannins. So if you ever had like a glass of red wine and then wondered what that red stuff on your lips is, that's actually the tannins precipitating and denaturing the proteins in your saliva. And unfortunately, it does the same thing with DNA when you extract DNA from uh, grapevine, even in the leaves. And it covalently binds to them. So if it does that, you can basically start from scratch all over. So we had to do some uh, optimizations to DNA extractions. But as Captain Jack Sparrow said, complications arose and yours were overcome. So eventually, we got there. And you can see like what I find nice continuous progress there. So we started with Kit 12. The lighter ones are earlier. The darker ones are later. So we got better on yield. And we especially got much better on error rate. You can see the Q score has continuously been shifting to the right pretty much. Um, so then I tried making an assembly out of that with uh, PCAT, which is a special, special assembler for phasing uh, genomes. And for a diploid, it worked rather well. So we got about 930 megabases of total size, which is about what you would expect. So here's the dot plot comparing that to the haploid reference genome. And you could see always two parallel lines. We got most chromosomes in less than five pieces, really, which is pretty good, actually, considering that we didn't feed any high C or 4C into that. Um, so I, I was happy with that. And 
normally I'd be done, but now I work in a breeding institute, so you got to do something with those genomes. And that then uh, leads me back to the t uh, topic of cluster architecture. So um, why are we interested in loose cluster? Well, the thing is, um, the summers are getting warmer in Germany, but also often they are getting more rainy. So what you have when it's raining a lot and it's rather warm, you got a lot of mold. So if you have like a very dense cluster architecture, like in the table grapes you see in the supermarket, then it's hard for that to dry off. But if they are smaller and more loosely, uh, then the wind can go through and it easier dries off and the wine becomes not so moldy at harvest time. So that is actually something we're very interested in. So about for about 217 different Riesling clones, we got phenotype data about the cluster density. Doesn't have anything to do with that sequencing metrics from a certain short read sequencing company. But here it's really about the density of berries in the cluster. Um, and we correlated that with set technologies uh, short read data um, to um, the genomic data. And we found some uh, interesting SNPs. And the very interesting thing about this was uh, there were eight significant peaks in the GWAS. And seven of them are in introns or UTRs of known genes. But one on chromosome eight was not anywhere any genes. So I was like wondering what's happening there. So I was wondering. I did this with the Pinot Noir reference genome, which is a haploid genome assembly, and I was wondering if maybe there's something different in Riesling than in the reference genome. So I started comparing the genomes themselves. So for that, I, I scaffolded my half-done genome assembly against the reference using Rectech, and it looks like pretty much you would expect with 38 scaffolds, so 2 times 19, and a total size of 914 megabases. And then I set out to look at that region on chromosome 8, so pretty much in the middle would be that SNP. And as we see, there's no gene in uh, the Pinot Noir reference genome. Um, and also not in the first haplotype of Riesling. But if we then look at the second haplotype of Riesling, there's something. So I used two different methods of calling the genes there. One was just lifting over the, geno uh, the gene models from the uh, reference genome. And the other one was using a pretty neat machine learning tool called Helixer that can de novo, without extrinsic evidence, predict uh, genes in a genome, and both of them found something there, and it actually seems to be a MIP transcription factor that is somewhat involved in, in berry development that does not really exist uh, in Pinot, or maybe it does because, as you can see there, it says chromosome 00, zero so it just couldn't be placed anywhere in the reference genome assembly, but in Riesling it seems to be only present in one haplotype and only sometimes. So I figured, can I actually improve my genome without scaffolding against the reference? So I thought maybe I could just use HIFIism, because you know everyone's using that these days with the lower error rate of nanoporids, and it looked like this. And this is not really a diploid assembly anymore. I mean, like it's more than four times the size of what it should be for a diploid species. That's a bit odd. And I was wondering what's going on there, and I spare you the dot plot of the whole genome. But let's just look at chromosome two here. And you see that there's now much more than two parallel lines, sometimes up to six. And I was like wondering, did I accidentally mix different plants in there? But no, I always worked on one plant from the greenhouse, so that's not the problem. So where does the stuff come then from? So the short answer is no, we can't just easily use hi fi but why is that? Um, so before, I've only used like nanopore, nanopore assemblers for assembling nanopore data, and they are used to the old times when nanopore had a lot of uh, errors in them. Um, and they would just make a consensus of the small differences, whereas HIFIism always was like tuned to pick up the small uh, differences in there. Um, and that's unfortunately what you see in perennial species. So there's now other people talking about the same in Africa that you have like at the meristem, three different cell layers that never quite mix but grow out. And in a leaf, you've got all three. One is making the vascular tissue, the other one is making the main leaves, and the other one is making the edges and they can mutate independently of each other. So my next challenge is looking at roots because there's only the vascular cell layer number two, and that should be homogeneous. And that's also the two little peaks we probably see at the k uh, plot, because these are where more than two haplotypes are actually the same. Um, but I promised ultra-long sequencing because, you know, normal nanopore sequencing is just too easy. And I was like, what had I gotten myself into there? Normally, you would start with cross-linking the nuclei. That's not really an option in grapevine because the polyphenols 
would attack your DNA much faster than the formaldehyde could crosslink anything, and you can't really block that at that stage. So I had to do something with native nuclei, and I used the circulomics nanobind disks and then adjusted a bit with the tegmentation enzyme. I was like, it's gonna be terrible, but I'm gonna find something positive in there. And then I was pretty surprised when I looked at that size distribution because I really didn't expect that. And now I hope that we can soon repeat that. Um, so I'm gonna use that to improve the existing assembly. And the other thing I promised, I know I'm almost uh, over my time, but I'm gonna be done in 30 seconds. Um, so something completely different again. Why are we interested in viruses or an RNA sec? Because it's for virus diagnostic. Normally you would use ELISA or qPCR. The problem with that is for both of them, you need like a specific primer or a specific antibody. And um, well, with a rapidly mutating virus like GPGV we are working on, you don't really have something that always works. So first we tried um, the cDNA sec protocol, which worked rather well. So I used the uh, um, active depletion to deplete against grapevine genes and got about 0.5% of all my reads mapping against the GPGV, including several hundreds, hundreds that were full length sequences. But then I was like, there's a new RNA sec, direct RNA sec kit coming out. So um, I tried that as well, and unfortunately that was really like 12 hours before the deadline, so I just took the data from the first 12 hours, and it's unfortunately very early in the season, so I only found like 60 GPGV reads there out of 45,000. First of all, because it was only 12 hours. Secondly, because early in the season, the virus kind of needs some time to speed up and really infect the plant. Um, but we can use the direct RNA sec kit, which would be interesting because there's also minor strand viruses in uh, nanopore, and we kind of want to be able to sequence them as well, and that works easiest with the direct RNA. So with that, I'm at the end of my talk. Um, thanks to our team at the Plant Breeding Institute in Geisenheim. Thanks to Oxford Nanopore for having me here, the European Union for funding some of our lab uh, equipment, the German Networks for Bioinformatics for supporting us with some cloud infrastructure and you all for your attention.